Hi, my name is Ray. I'm very excited to tell you about a decades of transformation of Google's data center network, Jupyter, through optical circuit switching and software-defined networking. This work was first presented at SITCOM 2022, and I have, I'd like to thank my colleagues, a very large group of people working across Google over the past decade to bring this a reality. Ten years ago, we built Jupyter in a classical three-tier CLO topology. At the bottom of this hierarchy are the servers that power all the familiar services that you use every day. Think about YouTube, Gmail, Google Search, Google Cloud. These services are connected by top-of-rack switches, as we call them, or tours, to aggregation blocks. Aggregation blocks are then interconnected by a layer of spine switches this architecture had allowed us to scale to more than 30,000 servers with a uniform 40 gigabit per second per server connectivity. That is 40 megawatt or more of infrastructure. But there are a few challenges remaining. At this scale, we need to be able to incrementally deploy and upgrade the network. But a closed topology typically means pre-deploying an extremely large spine layer of the latest generation of the day. The spy needs to be pre-deployed to avoid building-wide rewiring when we incrementally add aggregation blocks. Over time, however, as we deploy newer aggregation blocks with faster speed, the spy layer became the bottleneck. As the newer blocks are forced to run at derated speed, unless, of course, we refresh the entire spy layer, which would be an expensive and time-consuming undertaking, almost bordering impractical. Another emerging challenge was that we had grown accustomed to the cost efficiency improvement over successive network generations. Well, we came to expect that as we upgrade the network to the newer generation speed, our cost and power consumption per BPS is going to drop substantially. However, the signs are this trend is either decelerating or had completely stopped, similar to Moore's law. So we believed that we had to find architectural innovations to bend our scaling curve. So as we re-examined our architectural choices, we came to challenge a prevailing conventional wisdom that says that data center network traffic is unpredictable and therefore requires a non-blocking topology like CLO to support any and all traffic, arbitrary traffic patterns. But few things in nature are truly arbitrary, especially at large scale, patterns tend to emerge. We found, that, we found that at the aggregation block level, traffic is not only predictable, but largely follows a rather benign pattern called gravity model, which stipulates that the traffic from A to B is proportional to the product of total traffic out of A and the total traffic coming into B. This is basically the classical machine-to-machine -machine uniform random communication pattern manifesting on the block level. Therefore, we at Google posit that building the network for some theoretical worst case is an overkill. Over the past decade, we had incrementally but completely re-architected the Jupyter data center network, introducing a number of industry firsts along the way. First, we've introduced optical circuit switches as the intermediation layer for the building scale networks. It seamlessly supports heterogeneous technologies, upgrades, and service requirements. Second, direct mesh-based network topologies for higher performance, lower latency, lower cost, and lower power consumption. Third, real-time topology and traffic engineering to simultaneously adapt the network connectivity and pathing to match application communication patterns. Fourth, SDN orchestrated hit list network upgrades with localized add or remove of capacity while incurring no service downtimes. In the rest of the talk, we will go through these points one by one. First up, we want to talk about optical circuit switch and spine-free topology. Roughly eight years ago, we introduced optical circuit switches as the interconnection and interoperation layer between aggregation blocks and spine blocks. Here is a picture of a rack with eight optical circuit switches. Each OCS contains two arrays of mirrors that can steer light from any input port 
to any output port. This layer of indirection allows us to not only incrementally add aggregation blocks, but now also spine blocks without incurring a building-wide rewiring exercise. So when a new block is deployed, it's first physically wired up by fibers to the OCS, and then we reconfigure the OCS to graft the new block into the live network. A nice thing about these OCS is that it's data rate agnostic. So it doesn't need to be upgraded while the rest of the network transitions from 100 gig to 200 gig, 400 gig, and beyond. Now let's take a walk through this new architecture in a bit more detail. The aggregation blocks remain largely unchanged. Each aggregation block is made up of four middle blocks, as we call them, a top of rack switches fans out to all four middle blocks. Now let's zoom into one OCS and see how we configure the logical connectivity seen by the aggregation blocks. Let's say we want to create a bidirectional logical link between A and B. We would instruct the OCS to rotate the mirrors to cross-connect a port from A to a port from B in both directions. Similarly, we can create direct links between B and C and between A and C. An immediate consequence of this architecture is that as we refresh 100 gig blocks to 200 gig, the direct links between 200 gig blocks get to run immediately at 200 gig without needing to wait for the spines to get upgraded first. Now, this is the physical architecture of our network. Now, let's go into some software components that's driving this new architecture. I like to talk about traffic and topology engineering. Let's start with traffic engineering, which was first popularized in wide area networks. The idea here is to dynamically adapt routing to the changing traffic patterns. Unlike CLO, shortest path routing is no longer sufficient. Instead, we enable direct and two-hop indirect paths. Traffic is then split across shortest and non-shortest paths while observing link capacity and real-time communication patterns. The use of non-shortest paths introduced two challenges. One is how do we avoid routing loops? Let's consider these two paths, one going from A through B to C, and the other going from B through A to C. How do we avoid traffic looping between A and B? Well, we use VRF, or virtual routing and forwarding, to distinguish between transit traffic and locally sourced and synced traffic. Here is how we set up the ACE forwarding table. We basically have two VRFs, roughly speaking, one for the traffic originated from A and destined for C, one for traffic not originated from A, but just transit through A, and we set up a different VRF for them, and they follow different next hops to avoid the loop. The second challenge is known as hash polarization. This arises out of the fact that the switch offers only a handful of hash functions that are independent. That forces us to reuse the same hash function across different aggregation blocks. Hash polarization, if left unhandled, we learned, could result in as much as 33% imbalance and capacity loss. And we solved this by a scheme we called co-priming, which you can read more about in our ATC paper. Now, we didn't start with the full-blown dynamic traffic-aware routing optimization. Instead, we started with a demand-oblivious routing scheme called Valley and Low Balancing, or VLB. It is effectively the same routing scheme used in CLO, where traffic is split equally across all available paths through the spine. Now, if we combine each spine block with an aggregation block and collapse the associated links and paths, this is what we get. We get a uniform mesh topology with two links on each edge. What happens to the paths? Now, paths A and C on the left now map to the direct path on the right. And the path B now maps to the indirect path. This basically prescribes a complete demand oblivious routing and topology design for spine-free architecture. And this is quite appealing. With a simple uniform topology and an equally simple routing scheme, we can achieve the non-blocking property as CLO. So what's wrong with this? In this design, while the spines are physically removed, 
we're still paying the cost of the spine. It's just transferred to the aggregation block. To move beyond theoretical analysis, we look at the bottleneck link load in a production fabric. In reality, we find that the VLB is about 82% worse than the optimal. The fact that VLB requires ne nearly 50% of the aggregation box capacity reserved for transit only works for a subset of our fleet, unfortunately, but not all, because many of our, many of our aggregation blocks run at a utilization well beyond 50%, leaving no room for extra transit. Our next attempt was to reuse the optimization typically adopted in wide area networks, think model commodity flow or progressive water filling algorithms. But we soon found that the solution tended to be overfit to the predicted demand matrix. While I stated earlier that the data center traffic is predictable to a large extent, that prediction is rarely accurate. In fact, errors always exist in our prediction, large and small. So while on average, the scheme, multi-commodity flow, for example, formulation, works better than VLB, some link gets overloaded from time to time as a result of misprediction. So far, we've realized that the two schemes we just described, they sort of bookended a spectrum of solutions ranging from, on the one hand, complete demand obliviousness, to on the other hand, demand overfit. So what we need is really a configurable scheme to sweep this entire solution continuum. We want to be able to balance between optimality under correct prediction versus robustness under misprediction. So what we came up with was what we called variable hedging, whereas shown in the picture, the orange waveform. It simultaneously achieves better performance on average, as well as eliminates all the spikes from the overfit. So far, we haven't talked about topology engineering or traffic aware topology optimization. This is because for the most part, especially at the beginning of this journey, we found that a static and uniform mesh to be generally sufficient for a homogeneous fabric, provided the traffic follows the gravity model. But as I had mentioned, our network is anything but homogeneous. So we use dynamic and traffic aware topology to manage the speed heterogeneity. Let's consider a simple example. We have block A and B, which are 200 gig capable, and a block C, which is only 100 gig capable. Now suppose the demand matrix is given in the table. We find in this case a uniform mesh topology suffices where all traffic will go over the direct paths. But consider a different traffic matrix where the demand between A and B increases to 55T while the demand between B and C decreases to 15T. Well, we can see that now there is really no way to route and satisfy this demand under the uniform topology. Instead, what we need to do is to create more direct links between A and B and route 5T demand between A and C on the indirect path through B. This example, while simple, really illustrates two crucial points. One is that the topology optimization problem can be highly non-trivial under speed mismatch. Second, topology optimization must be jointly considered with the routing optimization. The fourth idea I want to go over with you is how we use SDN to orchestrate hitless network upgrade. We, as you all know probably, we adopted a locally, a logically centralized and hierarchical SDN control plane, Orion, to program and manage the thousands of switches, including OCS. Reconfiguring the topology from one pattern to another is now standard operational procedure with no human involvement nor application visible impact. Orion achieves this by carefully coordinating link drains with routing software and OCS reconfiguration, orchestrating thousands of dependent and independent operations. Thanks to the OCS and our SDN infrastructure, today the majority of topology reconfigurations are fully automated and require no physical work. One remaining challenge we had to solve was maintaining sufficient capacity throughout the reconfiguration so there's no application visible impact. To that end, we introduced two optimizations. First, we minimized the delta between successive topologies 
without compromising on optimality. Second, we carefully break down the topology delta to a sequence of coordinated incremental link moves. This incremental reconfiguration further minimizes the unavailable capacity at each step while limiting the blast radius of each change. Let's look at a simple example. Let's say we want to reconfigure the starting topology on the left to the target topology on the right. The starting topology consists of two life blocks, A and B, which are serving live traffic with services running, and the target is to connect two new blocks, C and D, into the network. Now, C and D currently are in the middle of being turned up, so they have no machines attached and hence no traffic. So we want to move to the target topology on the right where C and D are fully meshed in. Here we show the incremental schedule to reconfigure the starting topology to the target topology by disconnecting two live links at most at a time. And we always bring back online the reconfigured capacity before moving on to the next step. Over the past five years, we've migrated the vast majority of our existing fleet from closed topology to mesh topology. All this was done without interrupting the services running the network. At each step of this high-risk migration, we disconnect a few spine links in exchange for some mesh links. This is how we migrated a fabric from spineful to spine-free. The figure on the right shows for such a fabric undergoing live migration, how the traffic gradually shifts from going over spines to going over direct links. Overall, this new architecture has served in production for more than five years. And it has enabled new capabilities, support for incremental network builds, and heterogeneous technologies. We now have a 6.4 petabit per second aggregate bandwidth with 200 gigabit per second native interconnect. We have enabled higher performance, lower latency cost, and power consumption. We observe real-time application priority and communication patterns with zero downtime upgrades. Jupyter does all this while reducing flow completion by 10%, improving the throughput by 30%, using 40% less power, incurring 30% less cost, and delivering a 50x less downtime than the best known alternatives. Now let me conclude with some of our ongoing works. We want to jointly optimize not just topology and routing, but we want to bring in workload scheduling as well into the mix to enable predictable end-to-end -end performance. This is absolutely critical to the very large machine learning workload that sometimes needs an entire data center worth of accelerators. They're extremely intensive in bandwidth requirements and they're sensitive to tail latency. Second, managing speed mismatch attendant to operating multiple generations of network gears in the same fabric remains a challenge. Three, we want to replicate our success story inside the data center to other deployment environments like campus or even regional network to flatten the network topology and reduce the end-to-end -end latency. Our ultimate vision is that a data center or campus or even in an entire region as a single computer where compute, storage, and machine learning are jointly optimized with networking. With that, I'd like to thank you for watching.